shit, my friends and family. Here we are with the Warrior Poet Project podcast. It's been a small hiatus. I apologize, as always, about that. We got people interrupting us. It doesn't matter. It's all good, because we're off to the races here with my man, Jermaine Andre. What is going on, my friend? Not much. Thanks How you for doing? coming out. I'm yeah, doing good, brother. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome, man. So I was just looking, looking over there, and I see this this NBA championship looking ring <laughs> on your finger, but I know you don't hoop. Nope. So, so, so explain what that is. Well, for one, I'm too short to hoop. <laughs> so you're right with that one. Uh, this is from the United States Martial Arts Hall of Fame. Uh-huh. And I got, I actually got inducted in, it says on a 2012 on my 40th birthday. So as I was going over the hill and getting old, they gave me something to make sure I didn't get too depressed. They said, "Look, we know you're old, dude." But well, maybe man, they just didn't want you to—they just didn't want you to fight him anymore. They're like, "Listen, <laughs> he's trying to give me the This guy has stopped kicking our ass. <laughs> He'll leave us alone." <laughs> exactly. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah. so tell us a little bit about. Obviously, you know that's like it's like one of those movies, you know, where they show you like the end part first, and then you got to go back to the rest of the story. Right. So here's the end part. You got a big old badass ring for the Martial Arts Hall of Fame, but there's a lot of fucking work to get. Oh, man. Along that path. So, so take us all the way back to the beginning, man. Ooh, well, when you say beginning, I'm, I'm going to let you choose. Cause I want the I'm very like a beginning. I'm menu book. Yeah, I want, I, want, I want the, I want, you know, we don't have to go too slow, but I want to go all the way back to the start, you know? Okay, well, um, I was born at uh, St. Louis, uh, uh, Barnes Jewish Hospital. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, wait a minute. It's like, damn. <laughs> we got a couple hours, not a couple days. <laughs> well, um, I tell you, uh, I've been in the martial arts ever since I was a kid. Uh-huh. And um, I was actually a fan, Bruce Lee, Chuck Norris, Jean-Claude Van Damme, you know, mm-hmm. and I used to play with the martial arts, and I even had uncles who'd been in the wars and stuff like that, and they would teach me things and stuff like mm-hmm. that, but um, I ended up having to use the martial arts all the time to defend myself mm-hmm. and to defend my friends, and so, as the, you know, I got good at it, you know, because yeah. I play with it all the time, and next thing you know, I have to, ah, throw something, pow, here goes a guy flying across the room, so I was right. kind of like, well, this stuff is working. You know, so I started using well, it a lot. What were some of your childhood techniques that you liked? Sidekick. Sidekick. Sidekick was one of my favorite. And you watch I always too tell much everybody. Chuck Norris. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was Bruce Lee more. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, but no, Chuck, you're right. Chuck did Chuck, play a sidekick. Chuck he was mean killer. sidekick. The back fist and yeah. a sidekick. Yeah, yeah. But um, I even say today, I say to people always to my students, I say, if, if God came to me and said, you only get to use one martial art technique forever, and that's it, it'd be a sidekick. Because you right. can attack with it, uh-huh. you can defend with it, you know, you mm-hmm. can kick and lean back, and then you can retreat. Yep. Fake, like, you know, turn yeah, your head yeah. uh, like you're scared. Bam! Throw a spinning sidekick. So it's, <laughs> it's got a lot of range to it, uh-huh. you know. But the the sidekick was my favorite. And then I I started as I started getting more into junior high school, and I was, you know, as you can see, I'm this is not a basketball like say NBA Hall of Fame <laughs> ring. I was shorter than everybody, uh-huh. so I, was, I started get using my hands more. And I had an uncle who rose me in a lot of boxing also. So then I started hitting. And I shoot in and pick them up and slam them on the ground. So then I started kind of just mixing it up. Yeah. You know, early, then, early mixed martial arts techniques. Yeah, yeah. Early days, early days. Yeah. It was, uh, and I had, I had a lot of, uh, a lot of, you know, street fighting yeah. that was happening. But I always was usually finding myself, you know, standing up for my brother or something like that. Mm-hmm. And then you start getting that reputation, you mm-hmm. know, then everybody's coming after you all of a sudden. Mm-hmm. You know, so I just kept developing and developing and getting better and better. So you hone your skills in the streets, but eventually you, you started competing in some more sanctioned organizations, going through right. different, more traditional systems. So tell us Definitely. a little bit about that. Well, actually, I saw the UFC on TV, mm-hmm. um, the first ones when they first came out. Yep. And I said, I could beat those guys. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I said, yeah. you know, they, they're tough. They're not afraid. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But I'm not seeing a lot of martial arts getting used. Mm-hmm. You know? And uh, I said, man, I got I to gotta get into this. I got to get into this. So then that's when I decided to start competing. And which, where this all happened at is, like I said, if you, if the, the rabbit hole goes deep. You, you just call me Morpheus. You yeah. know what I'm saying? I got the blue pill and the red pill here. Which one do <laughs> you want to take? The red pill is the short story. The blue pill is the long one. <laughs> you know? I like, I like a little bit of both, man. Right. I don't like to choose. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why I tell you what. Uh, the, the story with me. Um, you know, as I came up through through high school, I actually graduated high school. Right when I graduated, I had a girlfriend who I was really close to, mm-hmm. and um, she moved. She uh, her mom was in lived in Wyoming, and she was dying of cancer, and she wanted to move back with her mom, mm-hmm. and so I actually moved with her to right? Wyoming. Yes, to Wyoming from St. Louis. Yeah, you know, now in Wyoming, now that's totally. Total culture change, you know what right. I'm saying? And so, that's, so you were the black guy that was in the Wyoming. The black guy, <laughs> yes, yes. But you yeah. know what? Wyoming was some of the nicest people I ever uh-huh. met in my life. Everywhere you drove, people just waved at you. 
Yeah. And I get mad, you know, I'm from St. Louis, you know, St. Yeah. Louis is the hood, you know, you don't wear, you don't look at somebody, what you looking at? You know, we're going to fight, you know, and maybe where I'll be like, what you, wait a minute, I can't, can I jump, get mad at him for waving at me? Why is he yeah. waving at me? But they were just a super friendly town. Yeah. And we actually, well, her mom ended up passing, you know, things were going, I had a job there, you know, working fast food, you know, mm -hmm. not doing anything real and things went bad for us. And there's not a lot of jobs in a, you know, a cowboy town, unless you're a cowboy. Mm -hmm. So we ended up uh, committing an armed robbery together. Yeah, we went we went straight by and Clyde because we it got really bad. It got bad to the point to where we were um, shoplifting food. You know, food. Right. We'd go and steal turkeys and stuff. We were about to get evicted. It was the winter time. Uh, our car was broken down. That, is that effective to shoplift a turkey? Seems like that. I would mean, be it like... feeds you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't for... seem like it's so subtle though. Look, you it was, know? Well, it was better than armed robbery. <laughs> you know, I mean, they, they don't send a task force looking for you after that. You know, it, I mean, I, somebody probably seen us doing. They were like, you know what, man, let them have it. You well, know, yeah, it's give, food. Just yeah. give them that turkey. Just let them have it. So I ended up going to prison for, uh -huh. um, for six years. Wow. Yeah, the first offender. You know, and um, I did uh, five years. Well, I did six years in there. I did a year in solitary confinement. That's what I'm telling you. The, the rabbit hole is deep with me. Mm -hmm. But that's actually where I saw, you know, the UFC. And I actually started a uh, martial arts school in the prison. And right there, and you know, the, the books I mailed you guys tells all about that. And uh, started training uh, inmates and even the uh, the guards. You know, I earned the trust of the warden. He actually gave me uh, the uh, gym at for certain hours to train, and allowed us to fight. You know, we fought bare knuckle mm -hmm. in there. You know, and that's where my start my start actually happened. Mm -hmm. So I get interested in the uh, ultimate fighting. Interesting. So how was your, you know how was your time spent? First of all, did you you know did you have to deal with the guilt of of hurting somebody that you shouldn't, or was it just kind of? A money thing you got caught you know how, how did that go for you well it was uh and it i always like to tell people you know it, we anybody can go the wrong way mm -hmm. you know um when you when your options when you when you see this and it's the only option you think you have you got no choice mm -hmm. you know and you put yourself in this position where what can i do you know i always say to everybody well what would it take for you to do this you know your family starving your, your wife starving you know you feeling like it's over you know and i was always like i, said, I always got in trouble for sticking up for everybody else i always got yeah. in fights sticking up for people you know sticking up for the you know for the uh the guy who was getting bullied in school and then i get into fight with the bullies and mm -hmm. you know and beat them up then here come him and his big brothers and i beat them up then somebody go to the hospital then i you know i get in trouble so it was always yeah. that so Here's my girl whose mom just died of cancer, you know, mm -hmm. and she's crying on my shoulder. And I'm feeling like, dude, I'm a D loser of the century. You know, we're about to get evicted. We're still in food. You know, man, we, we got to do something. And I actually, when I was going to do it, she said, well, you're not going by yourself. I'm going with you, you know. And so I said, okay, well, fine. So, no, of course, nobody got hurt mm -hmm. um, as far as, you know, somebody getting shot or something like that. But you always have to look at things as, you know, the, the golden rule keeps you straight. Yeah. You know, would I want somebody to stick a gun in my mom's face? You yeah. know, just if, if she's working her job right now, some guy come in, you know, with good intention, you know, just trying to feed his family and stick a gun in my mom's face. That, that gun could go off. Anything could go wrong. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, you yeah. think like that, that helps you to say, OK, that was wrong. You right. know, even though I was I was doing a, what you call doing the uh, wrong thing for the right reason. You right. Know, I was trying to take care of mine, you know, trying to, you know, help my help with my family. That was still the wrong thing to do because you don't want anybody to do that to yours. Mm -hmm. So, but um, as far as being on the inside, the the um, actually the place I was sent to was uh, the prison was a rehabilitation prison where they actually believed in you know trying to straight the, straighten the prisoners out. So that helped a lot. The warden there was a really uh, good man. When That's I, cool to hear that story because yeah. you hear well, a lot of other bad you know. Yeah, bad well, it flipped. I went to that. I went to solitary confinement for a year for a reason, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. And um, when I first went in, he told me he actually said, uh, you know, you got a choice. He said, "Man, you're smart." He said, "You don't belong here." You know, you uh, what you did, you know, anybody would have done. You know, what I'm saying that's uh, th these people were real. I'm gonna yeah. tell you something. When I when I when the sheriff was taking me away, he said, uh, "You guys are too young to be going to prison like this, man." And I was like, yeah. And they, they all, these are old cowboys. I'm talking <clears throat> real cowboys. He said, dead man tell no tales. And I said, what? He said, yeah, I should have killed the witness. I said, are you serious? And he just kind of looked back at me. I said, wow, that's some hell of some advice from the sheriff. <laughs> you know, you know, where were you when I needed you? You know, hey, can you still get it? You know what I'm saying? So, so you know what I'm saying? So they always kept it real. So the warden said, the warden had this belief that, you know, I'm not a better person than you because I'm not in here. Right. You know, maybe I had better opportunities than you did. Maybe I had better choices than you. My whole objective is to make sure you don't come back. 
So he said, you know, you got a good build on you. I'm going to put you to work in the kitchen so you can eat good food. You know, uh, I got a, we got a $100,000 gym in there that you guys can work out in. Um, and you're going to college or you're going to solitary confinement. So I said, well, maybe I said, man, I ain't got no money for no college. I'm from a poor family, you mm -hmm. know. And he said, we'll pay for it. And I was like, well, wait a minute, where am I at? <laughs> you know, I said, okay, yes, sir. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So he had that kind of thing going. Uh, when I was in there, that place had, you didn't have any fights. You had... Uh, didn't have arguments because you were given trailer visits with your wife once a month, everybody. But so your wife was it. in jail too though, right? Yeah, she was. Yeah. yeah. And they still let that happen. No, they didn't let us. We oh, couldn't okay, until yeah. she got out. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So everybody in there, it was like, you know, you got your wife, he got his wife, we got everybody got a wife, you yeah. know, and we get into it. You owe me some money, some cigarettes. You didn't pay me like you're supposed to. And I see you eating a nutty boy. So I know you got money, but <laughs> you said, oh man, somebody gave me this. I'm saying you shouldn't be eating a nutty boy. You owe me, you know what I'm saying? So we get ready right. to get into it. The guard going to say, look, you guys want to roll around with each other or roll around with your wife? And I'm saying, you know what? <laughs> easy choice. Easy. <laughs> easy. Yeah, so he yeah. had he had it perfect. You know, uh, the place was, was set up. We ate good food. You know, uh, when you walked out there into the um, chow hall, there was the warden sitting there eating with us. You know, mm -hmm. the guards ate with us. The guards hung out in our, you know, the cells were like dorm rooms. But his, his idea was, you know, you got to decide, do you want to turn these guys into animals and put them back on the streets? and see what happens, or you wanna give them some respect, some responsibility, and allow them the opportunity to become good people. Give them, give them some choices and a chance. And so um, I did like three years under that warden, and then the politics changed. And a new governor came in, they assigned the Department of Corrections. They took away the um, trailer visits. Well, they tried. They took away everything. So I slowly taking away the switching the guards out with ex Marines and telling these Marines, you know, you got to keep these guys in line. This and that, you know. Whereas before, you right. know, they come, you know, not going to do. Hey, get ready. You going to nurse call? Oh, okay. Yeah, let me finish this movie. What are you watching? They come in. Oh man, we checking out this. Ain't these? Oh, okay, we got to go now. Okay, I'm coming. You know, no handcuffs or nothing. You know, it was a, it was a real strong honor system. You know, and uh, now it's you know, get ready for nurse call. Okay, I'm getting ready right now. Move it now. Okay, I said I'm coming. We start rack four, you know, and they come in and whoop your ass, you know, pop out, you know, and then so we start, hey, what are you doing to him? Hey, you guys gotta hey, we need backup up here. Now here come a whole bunch yeah, of you know. Yeah, yeah. So they agitated this. That and, aggression just breeds aggression. Oh my you goodness. Know, especially yeah. against prisoners, you know. Yeah, right. So this got agitated. Well, I'm sitting back, I think a month away from my parole hearing, and I'm watching my buddies go down. You know, and I'm watching this happening. The gang start forming because they took the trail of visits. And the warden, Dwayne, said, you take the trail of visits, I'm out because it's over. You know, he knew you, you can't take a man from a woman. When, yeah. you, when you call the separation, it's, you know, it's game over. And they finally, the authority came where they took the trail of visits. So he, he quit. He actually quit and left. And uh, it started, all hell started breaking loose. You know, the Aryan, Her uh, Aryan Brotherhood started forming, the Crips, the Bloods, the Black Guerrilla Family, all the wow. Mexican Mafia, American Indian. Everybody starts separating and start going to war. Well, I've always been the type of person where, you know, I, I've never seen color. I've never understood it. You know, I've mm -hmm. always, you know, and I've had people from all different angles try to pull me in all different, I just, I, I don't get it. I can't just dislike or like somebody because of what, what I'm seeing here. <laughs> it just, I don't get it. So I never got, so I could always speak from that level. And I kind of started speaking to some of the head guys saying, what are y'all doing, man? You know, we all used to be friends. Y'all get ready to start going to war with each other. And y'all don't see what they doing. And then I said the same to the guards. I said, look, you in here. Yeah. You know, what do you think is going to happen when all hell breaks loose? You got to be in here. They, they're yeah. not in here. They collecting a yeah. million dollar money. You know what I'm saying? So I actually got the whole maximum, medium, and minimum yard to stand together in a peaceful protest. And so they did not like that. So they <clears> came <throat> in with dogs and shotguns and took, my, <laughs> took me off the yard, put me in a hole for a year. Wow. You know, yeah, it was... It was pretty nasty. <sighs> that's a that's quite a quite a fucking story. So that's the so, short so what about, well, that's what the about, short one. <laughs> well, what about yeah? What about solitary though? I mean, how is that? How is I because I've often that I had a good friend who he went there for some um, white collar issue that he had, you know, and they actually just stuck him straight in the hole because of some politic thing, you know, which is which was weird, you know, it wasn't even a violent crime, but he was in the hole for a couple months at the time. And like all, the only thing they gave him was a Bible, and he wasn't religious. But <laughs> being in the hole with the Bible for three months, he came out a religious. You come out religious, <laughs> yeah, right. you know, because right. that was it. You know, he had like a little bit of light in that one fucking book, and that's mm. all he had. Well, they actually, I went to you had what's called, and this you gonna like this a little bit. It's called a pink sale, and it was actually mm -hmm. painted pink. All the walls were, and this was the worst place you could go to. You know, it was, uh, and it was a sale. There was just, uh, there was no bed. You know, you had a toilet in there. 
and you slept on the floor. You didn't get a blanket, you didn't get a pillow, you know, suicide watch, as they call it. So you froze halfway to death. This is Wyoming. You know, you yeah. froze in there. And you, uh, you, all you had was your underwear. Well, they put me in there. You're only supposed to be allowed to be in there for, you know, I think uh, two weeks. They put me in there for like 30 days, you know, longer than they were supposed to. And then eventually I got moved. You know, that, like I said, that's the, the longer story of how I got moved. I, I went through some things in there in my mind and, and said some things to a guard and <laughs> made some things happen. But they move you, then you get moved to what's called supermax solitary confinement where there's a tier of 12 cells. And you all are locked down for 23 hours, you know, because they still don't have a lot of room in the prison. So they still have to put you on, mm-hmm. on a tier. And you get, an hour, you get an hour out to take a shower. You get to walk the... Um, like, the like, tear mm-hmm. to the shower and you get to hang out if you behave they leave you out and you got these little things called bean shoes they put your food through you see on tv they mm-hmm. slide your food in a little hole like a rat you know those stay open and that's i mean if they leave that open for you that's like the shining light because then you can see across the other inmates talk to each other and we all mastered i'm talking like within two weeks uh sign language it was bad as hell i came down there and everybody's i'm like what are you guys doing sign language and i'm like how'd y'all learn that they, they got class here you'll learn it and we all just, you know, we learned how to do it. And the guards could never pick up on it from us because, you know, of course they could see down the tier, uh-huh. but they couldn't see our fingers close enough. So we all mastered this sign language. We'd be signing each other, you know, and doing stuff like that. But um, actually, the I would I would never, I wouldn't take a, I wouldn't take a million dollars to take away my solitary confinement experience. Because when I went, you know, I went to solitary. I was three weeks away from a parole hearing, you know, to go back mm-hmm. to my, you know, my woman, my family, everything. And me standing up like that, I knew that I was probably going to get taken out because it was, you know, the system was agitating. And the new warden who was in, he was, I mean, he was just horrible. He was one yeah. of the meanest guys on the planet. You know what I'm saying? And he was trying to take everything and everybody down. He's looking for, they were trying to lock the prison down. You know, right. we, we got these problems. We need this money to build a new place. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. I knew I was going down. But I said, I, I can't not stand up for my friends. I just, I, I couldn't feel good not doing that. So I lost mm-hmm. my parole, of course. You know, but while I was down there, you know, you get all kinds of things happening in solitary, you know, uh, burnings, you know, like, you know, I'm not people. <laughs> you just toilet paper and messing mm-hmm. with the guards and all this. And, and, and Wyoming's old school. You got, you know, AIM, American Indian Movement, Mexican Mafia, you know, all these hardcore people down there. And all of them knew who I was because of what I had done. You know, I led everybody in this, you know, this uh, protest. So everybody respected me. Well, I still, like I said, I wasn't a cop hater. I yeah. never hated cops. I never hated guards. So when they be messing with the guards, I you know I just and be in my cell, knocking out push ups, you know shadow boxing, boom boom hitting the yeah. wall with my elbows and shins, you know just doing martial arts. So one time a guy asked me, he said, "Hey Bam," and that was my name in a Bam Bam. Hey Bam, you know I was like, "Hey, yeah. said, uh, why don't you ever you know f with the guards when we do?" And I said, "Because they're not bothering me." He said, they're bothering you by keeping you locked up. I said, no, nah, me putting a gun in somebody's face got me locked up. Right. You know, and he's like, oh, no, nah, bull crap. You know what? Well, they did this and they they robbed this and they did, they did this to your people and my people. I said, yeah, and our people did some things too. I said, but everybody came together to give us something where we shouldn't have to do that anymore. I yeah. said, so I'm not making them responsible for me. That guard didn't do anything to me. And I said, second of all, I said, that's the dude who's serving your food, you idiot. You think he didn't piss in it? You know, when I said that, it got everybody's attention. Yeah. You know, and, and one of the we had some old mafia heads down there. Yeah. And one of the mafia heads was like, oh, "That's a good point, Bam Bam." You know, and once he says, and everybody just started kind of listening. Yeah. And so it, it came up to the point. And I said, "You know, we started. I started arguing with the guy. I asked him. I said, look, man. I said one thing I'm not about is about bullshit. I said I'm just gonna put it to you like this. Everybody sitting here, you got anybody you care about for real? Now let's let's cut the tough guy stuff. I said we all down here in the hole. We the toughest dudes on the planet. You know, we got terrorists down there, hostage takers. We got them all, and we all in here." I said, so let's cut the bull crap. I said, anybody got anybody you care about? Everybody, yeah, you know, I care about my mom, my sister, this and that. I said, okay, mm-hmm. if something was to happen, somebody broke in that house with a knife right now, I was going to cut her up and do everything to her. Who you going to call? And one of the guys said, 911. I said, exactly, the cops. So mm-hmm. quit acting like y'all said, everybody quit being fake. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So everybody playing this little tough guy role. When it come down to it and you need help, you dial a 911, fool. So everybody, <laughs> now, we supposed to, you know, we supposed to be the realest people on the planet. I said, yeah. that's all we got. Yeah. Is that we supposed to be hundred percent real? That's why we locked up because we said f this. I'm standing up and doing what what, what I feel I should do. The yeah. last thing we need to do is be down here acting like some punks. You know what I'm saying? And picking on you know female guards and and dudes who just down here just just doing their job. You know they if if that's the case then bust out or something. You know but mm-hmm. picking on this guy so that ended up you know kind of setting a tone. Well then they would hear me you know like I said, I'd be working out and I happened one of the um, inmates happened to see me. 
because they, you know, I told you we get out for that hour where they had it, yeah. what's called a day room, and I take a shower, and I was doing some uh, some counters and shadow boxing, and he saw me, which I was trying to kind of keep hid, because mm -hmm. a lot of these guys, even though they knew who I was, they didn't know of me. You know, I've yeah. been on the yard already. A lot of people knew I knew martial arts stuff. But that's not the kind of thing you want to do. You don't want people to think you're a badass in prison. You know, because you're gonna get right. challenged. Right. You know, so he saw me, and he was like, you know, and I went to lock down. He said, hey, bam, you know, why don't you show us something that you was just doing? I'm like, what? No, man, I seen you. Who changed you? The Chinese? Da -da, he started dropping all these names. <laughs> you CIA? What's it? I'm like, oh, my God. You know, last thing you want is him thinking you're you a possible rat, uh, undercover cop, you know. So uh -huh. I'm like, oh, man, uh, it's over for me. They're going to they gonna take me out. You know, so he's asking. So everybody started kind of breaking in, and he started talking crap. They're like, what, what was he doing? He was doing that march. I'm telling you, man, he, he, the Chinese or something trained him. He, he, you from China? What you know? He's, he's saying all this stuff. Well, you know, he took over the whole prison, this and that and this. And, and he did this and that. And he took out 15 guards. Man, I ain't take out no 15 guards. You know, the story getting better as you're going. You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, oh, man. So they keep, everybody starts tuning in. You know, and they want to do all that martial arts stuff don't work. So he, I'm telling you, man, he'll whoop your ass with that stuff. I'm seeing him. I ain't never seen nobody move like that. That's what he's just talking up, sitting like, oh, man. <laughs> you know, so then, of course, uh, the uh, old mafia head guy who, with the, you know, with the quiet voice, he's yeah. like, hey, bam, come on, man, just show us a little bit. And I'm like, nah, man, I, I, that ain't what it's for. I, said, I just exercise with it. And he's like, bam, come on, man. We all been locked down here. for Some of us been down here for four or five years. You know, it'd be nice just to see something. So I was like, so it got to the point where I couldn't say no. Right. You know, it'd be an insult. So I was like, crap. So I was like, all right. So I was like, hey, try, 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 stop, try, try. doing everything. And ended with a backflip. Bah! And I stopped and I just kind of, you know, like walk up. Everybody's like, holy shit, man, you see that? I told you. I told you. Kid. Oh, my God. I've never seen it. And, and I didn't know how fast or anything I was. You know, I just trained all the time and did everything. That's what I did with my spare time, especially mm -hmm. since I was locked up. I said, you know, well, I'm locked up. At least I'm gonna do is take care of my body, you know. And my, you know, I'm not gonna eat junk. I'm not gonna smoke cigarettes. I'm not gonna drink coffee. I'm not gonna watch TV. I'm gonna work out and do everything I can to come out of here the best that I can. Yeah. And so I was really good, and I didn't even know it. And they saw it. So after they saw it, one of the main knuckleheads said, "Yo, bam, man, you teach me that stuff." You know, I said, hmm. and then it hit me. You know, I said, uh, I said, nah. I said, nah. I said, I'm not gonna teach you because you're using the wrong way. Yeah, so you always run around stabbing people and mess. I said, I'm not gonna teach you so you can go beat up some old woman and take her purse. He said, man, I wouldn't do something like that, man. You know, I said, no, nah, this stuff is for supposed to be held in an honorable way, man. You know. Yeah. And so he's like, I would never do. I said, all right, I tell you what, you start saying sir and ma'am to the guards, and then I train you. So I thought that was it. Yeah. So I lock it down. You know, we going through our <laughs> days. You know, a couple of days pass, and I'm sitting in my cell, and I hear, yes sir, yes ma'am. <laughs> You're like, like, oh shit, <laughs> what the? You know, did he just? You know, yeah. So first thing I'm thinking is, oh god. I got to stick by my word, uh, yeah, you know, but sure. then I said, well, wait a minute, it worked, you know, and I'm listening to him and he kept doing it and it didn't seem like he was doing it, you know, just for that purpose, but he really believed in what he was doing. And if he believed in what I was showing that much that he was willing to start saying, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, to the guards in front of all these guys, you know, who were hundred percent against him. I said, you know, well, I got to, I got to stand by that. Even if it means my life, you know, he, mm -hmm. he took a stand by what I said and I got to stand by what I said. And so I started what they, I started training him. And then next thing you know, everybody started, you know, just calming out with the guards. So the guards finally pulled me out, the head, the lieutenant. It's like, hey, man, what are you doing down there to get all these people under control? I said, first of all, I ain't got nobody under control. <laughs> I said, don't get it twisted. They got themselves under control. Yeah. They do what they want to do. You know, I said, I just just kind of hollered at them, man. You know, y'all in here with us. You know, I mean, right. you ain't my enemy. You know, and they were like, you know, the lieutenant was like, oh, man, we appreciate, you know, you doing that. You know, you need anything, you know? Yes, I do. <laughs> you know, uh -huh. vegetarian meals. Can we get a TV for the Super Bowl? This and that. You know, I started just breaking. He's like, you know, we'll get your TV down there for the Super Bowl. I was like, right now. So that's how kind of how it started. So I came back down and kind of let everybody know. And they, you know, I started eating vegetarian food. They started sending the vegetarian food for everybody. So that whole tier just went. So it got to the point where they started letting us out two at a time where I can train them in the martial arts. We can spar and work out and everything. And then when I came out of solitary, the uh, yard warden pulled me in and said, I heard about what you did down there. How would you like to? You know, continue that on the maximum yard. I said, well, definitely, man. He said, well, I just want to make a deal with you. I said, what's that? He said, if any badasses come in who think they're badasses, can I send them to you? I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> I said, please do. I said, but, I said, you have to let us fight bare knuckle. Yeah. And he said, no, you're going to kill somebody. I said, no, that's not what I'm trying to do. I said, I'm not trying to break people down. I'm not trying to hurt them. I'm trying to help them to get real. You know, everybody right. coming here with that right. bullshit because, and I know because I came here with that bullshit until the guards, you know, put it on me and whooped my ass one day, you know, with clubs and uh, grenades and everything else. And the uh, lieutenant told me, Jermaine, no, you are a badass and we look at you like that and we will always approach you in that manner. And when he said yeah. that, I said, 
thanks. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but it made me get real. You know, yeah. okay, I am a bad, so I can't be, you know, putting myself off like this or somebody going to put a bullet in my head. Yeah. You know, so I said, I'm just trying to give them that same thing, that all, all this stuff you bring in this bull crap, let's find out what you're really made of. And I said, you know, and they're going to have to hold respect. You know, if any of them get any write-ups, anything I see, anything weird, they, they off the team. You know, mm -hmm. so the warm's like, you got it. You know, we'll even get you, we'll set a ring up and let you guys have some fights sometimes and stuff. So that's where we started at. How many fights do you think you got in under that system? Oh, my goodness. Um, well, I had a boxing, an actual boxing match with uh, gloves in mm -hmm. the ring. They actually used to open up the whole uh, system and let the town come in and watch us box. But um, as far as bare knuckle, that's what we did almost every day. <laughs> you know, and it, that's, I mean, we, we'd get up and we'd get up and run. We'd get up and train. We'd lift weights. You know, uh, we we had we lunged. There was this. We took every dumbbell on a rack and put it out for lunges. And I just said, "See what you can make it." You know, ten sets on each one, and we just climb and climb and climb. And then we kick each other to death. And then at the end, we wrap up with just hand wraps, and then we sparred. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, of course, I always I was always the best. Mm -hmm. You know, and I always tried not to bruise people's faces. So I beat. That's why we kick the legs and everything, and take them out, just tear their legs up and stuff. But when they wanted to move up to instructor rank, then they had to actually fight me bare knuckle. And so that that ended up kind of nasty sometimes, <laughs> you know. Like I said, yeah. I was never t trying to intentionally, sure. you know, but hurt it's a, it's anyone. It's a fucking bare knuckle but fight. But this the martial arts. It's yeah. the martial arts, and I had to show you reality. You know, that's yeah. one thing they had to know. I mean, one of my guys one time asked me, "Man, does that does that bull crap with hitting people in the throat work?" So I said, "Pow!" I hit him in the throat. He goes, oh, <laughs> he's like, "Man, what'd you do that for?" I said, "You asked me if it worked. You, you could have answered." I said, "But you wouldn't have believed me." Yeah. You know, okay, I, I, I could say, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're right, I did ask you. You know, I said, but now, what's your favorite technique? Yeah. Hitting the throat, I said, exactly. So now you know you got it if you ever need it, you know? Yeah, so yeah. I always want people to have a sense of reality while we're in there. I think, you know, that's one of the things, one of the reasons I tend to get along really well with, you know, a lot of fighters is even fighters, obviously your situation was on the extreme end of that, but even <laughs> yeah. the people who are training to go into a cage fight, be an amateur or pro, you're facing a lot of your own demons when you're doing that. Yep. You're finding out what you're, what's really inside of you. You know, all of these ideas and things that you have in your head about what you are, what you want to be, what you think you are, what you're doubting about yourself. You put that shit to the test. And then if you pass that crucible, you know, you come out a different person. And it's the same with some of the plant medicine stuff that I do as well. I mean, going to a serious, you know, ayahuasca journey or a boga journey you're going to see what kind of shit you got inside Yeah, you're going to see you. You're going to see you. Yeah. <laughs> and, the, and anybody, you know, one way or another, I think everybody needs to have some system that allows that to happen. Otherwise, you just get off in this fucking fantasy land of Well, you get, up, you get off in what the, world, what the world wants. Right. You know, the truth of the matter is, you know, um, we're all puppets. You know, all day long we have to censor ourselves, edit ourselves, behave certain ways to be able to operate and function within society, which we have to have. Mm -hmm. We have people running around out there butt naked. I don't want to see that. You know what I'm saying? So I'm not against those rules. But, man, training is it. I tell everybody. I don't mind if people run around butt naked. <laughs> what do you mean? I guess people run around butt naked. <laughs> yeah. be fucking well, fine for me. If there's 10 people running around butt naked in the parking lot, I'd be like, that's awesome. Look, all these people are running around butt naked. That's great. Well, see, this is where we disagree. <laughs> I don't want to see that. <laughs> now, wait a minute. There might be some girls I don't mind seeing. But that's as far I don't as I mind. Let them all. Let all, the, let all the crazy animals out there running around naked. So, but I always tell everybody, you want to find out what somebody's truly made of, train with them. Yeah. You totally. know, I, I say that when people in martial arts students come in, I'm going to find out everything I need to know about you in, you know, a, a 45 minute session. Yep. When I work you out, I'm going to find out what you think about yourself. If you give up, if you quit, you know, if you're a learner, you know, if you're arrogant, if you're humble, you know, you're going to find all that out when you start getting fatigued. Mm -hmm. When you start getting fatigued, oh, yeah. that's when the real deal come out, man. <laughs> you know, yeah. you start sure. realizing. For sure. So this this is like the the ultimate fertile training ground for a young tiger. So you come out. Wow, you, that's funny you said that. Did you read the book yet? <laughs> no, I have the book. So oh, did you look at the cover? I looked at the cover. Because we were called the Muay Tigers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. Um, so, but then you came out and then it's time to, you know, to step it up. So, so tell us a little bit about your career, some of the highlights, some of the things that went from there. Well, the first thing you have to understand is why I fall. And that's, mm -hmm. that's a really funny one. Um, when I was, you know, of course, when I had my martial arts school in there, to me, a student was like family. That was that was blood. And mm -hmm. I had a lot of great students. And there was actually one of them who asked me, he said he wanted to fight. He said, uh, man, you you know, it was actually the one who um, the first one I started training. And uh, um, his name was Tony. 
the first one I started training, and he asked, he said, do you think I could be a champion? Well, he was a guy who, he came from a horrible background. You know, his, his mom was, you know, she was uh, on the streets and stuff like that. He'd been around these horrible guys that beat them all the time and treat them really bad, so he hated men. So mm-hmm. I said, number one, you hate men, <laughs> you know, so you be, you destroy them, you know, because you, you don't want to let any man beat you. Yeah. I said, so, and you got tons of talent, tons of skill, you're strong. I said, yeah, you definitely could be a champion. Well, he said, well, man, how would I get into, you know, into it? Do you have connections? I said, well, I said, no, nah, I've been, uh, I came here when I was 19 years old. No, I don't have connections. I don't say, but, you know, I said, all you have to do is come out and just start fighting. And so we, the conversation happened. Well, what happened was I told him I'd start fighting. And mm-hmm. we said we actually set a plan, and it was for me to come out and start fighting. But I said, you know, it costs to fight as an amateur. You don't get paid yeah. until you make it and become something. I said, so you know, I'm from a broke family, you know, and I come out there, I, I got nothing sitting waiting for me. It's, it's zero, you know, a less than zero is where I'm starting. You know, I said, but I'll start fighting if that's what you want to do because I'm really interested in continuing the school so that not only when you guys come out, you got something solid to come to. You know, if you want to fight or whatever you want to do, and for people even out there who want a, a good sense of some really real martial arts that come from a real serious, strong fighting background. Mm-hmm. You know, so I said, it's, it's a good idea. So I said, but I said, I don't want to be a fighter though, but I'll fight, you know, I'm the sensei. And when you come out, I'll put you in to the fight game and I'll pull out. Well, so I'll have a part-time job, be fighting amateur fighting. You know, um, when he comes out, I go to, you know, I go to pro or big time fights, quit my job. He works the jobs, pays the bills. So we had that plan and it happened just like that. I came out, started fighting. Uh, he came out, I got him a fight, but then he ended up going back to the streets, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, getting involved with the bad stuff, you yeah. know, which of course I wasn't, you know, I wasn't having that around me at all. Yeah, yeah. And so the chain was broken right there. Then I actually had uh, another one who was one of my top guys who was supposed to be coming out probably a year behind. And he was actually the money guy. Like he was, um, he had been in there for about 15 years. Wow. And he always, you know what he went to solitary confinement all the time for? Making money. They hated him and he would be, he ran lottery, so cigarette, and it was all good, clean stuff. You know, he didn't do, they would draw nothing, but, but he was just a money man. Yeah. And so he's supposed to come out and, you know, start financing and getting everything together on the money side. Well, he ended up pulling an escape for his wife, you know, which I don't know how I'm going to get mad at him for what I did for my, you know, so, right. and he ended up getting caught and got thrown back in, you know, so I'm sitting out here like, it's just you. Yeah, what the hell's going on, man? You know, so now I'm stuck in this fight game, but I had actually, when I came out, I started training under Ron Smith. In Muay Thai mm-hmm. kickboxing, and uh, Slava from Russia started training in Russian sambo. So now, you know, the, the code of honor in the martial arts is buried into my soul. That's all I've got, and so now my loyalty's boom to them. So I'm like, <clears throat> okay, well, I got to keep fighting. So I kept fighting. Plus, it was good that I had the fight game, you know, because I don't know what else I would have done, you know, for honestly, you know. Um, so I just kept fighting, kept fighting, kept fighting, kept fighting. And one day, Ron Smith said to me in a conversation, he said, "Man, wouldn't it be cool to be the world champion?" You know, and I was just kind of like, you know. Yeah, I guess so. And then he kind of walked away. He said, yeah, it'd be cool to be the trainer of the world champion. And I was like, I said, is that right? Okay. Uh-huh. You know, so that put me on a mission. You know, yeah. so boom, boom, I started fighting, fight, kept fighting, 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 and worked my way all the way up and up to the WFA middleweight world title shot in Las Vegas and, and took that. But. Um, nice. So what's, which organization is that? Uh, world, world Fighting Alliance. World Fighting Alliance. Yeah. yeah. And what are the rules of that? Just. It was MMA. The same kind of rules as UFC. Uh-huh. And it was actually, you remember John Lewis? You might remember him? Uh, yeah. Old school. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, old school UFC stuff. Yeah. But, uh, you know, the, the what was it, UFC bought the WFA up. Okay. And they actually were still using the, the WFA for like a bunch of uh, pro fights. Mm-hmm. But I was on there. I was actually, it was actually the first show, MMA show to ever happen in Las Vegas, the first sanctioned MMA show. And I actually won the first sanctioned MMA world title in Las Vegas. Nice. And this belt, I'm telling you, you know, you have to look at my website. It is no joke. It's all real stuff. It's heavy. It's probably about 20 pounds. It's got yeah. snake skin on the back. It's got nice. real jewels in it. It's bad, <laughs> man. Yeah. It's like, yeah, right on, man. So it was a nice belt. But that was, you know, I fought in Japan. I fought in Hawaii. I had a, you know, and when I was fighting, uh, everything was new. You know, the UFC was, you know, the UFC had just came out. So the UFC wasn't the top league yet. You know, you had the WFA, you had rings. I mm-hmm. fought a lot for rings on the Monty Cox, you know. Uh, we fought, uh, you know, I fought in Japan, I fought in Hawaii, I fought in Canada. And it was kind of, it was, it was fun, but it was depressing at the same time because here I go to Japan and fight and everybody knew I was. And, you know, Bill Boy's supposed to come home nobody knew who I was. Because, <laughs> you know, you, it wasn't legal yeah, to fight. You know, you couldn't fight in Missouri. Sure. We could fight in Illinois, but not in Missouri. And then they, they weren't airing anything then. You know, they, they'd film it. 
but they show it in Japan or something. You know, it got shown somewhere where, you know, you couldn't even see it in America. You know, I go fight in Hawaii and go over there, to, you know, Team USA versus Team Hawaii. We a smash the team, you know, big parties in Hawaii, everything, you know, in Las Vegas, my face was on a billboard when I got off the plane. Mm -hmm. You know, Jermaine Andre for the fight for the world title, you know, came on with the bell, stepped off the plane, you know, uh, what do you call it? tumbleweed rolling by, you know? <laughs> I'm like, man, come on. You know, I said, man, what is going on here? You know, so it was it was a it was a hard struggle. And right when MMA blew up, it started blowing up, was when I just my injury started setting in. I've had like a a pin and staples in my left foot since I was sixteen years old. Mm -hmm. You know, so I was even through my fight career, sometimes I couldn't even stand on my foot. Mm -hmm. You know, I even developed a, you know, my Muay Thai front push kick where I'd stand on that back leg and, you know, just paw with that left leg like a jab because sometimes it would go numb, you know, in a fight mm -hmm. where I couldn't feel it. And I'd be like, oh, crap. So i just go here, you know, just start kicking and keep them off of me. Yeah. So. Man, that's a, hell of, that's a hell of a story. One thing that seems consistent is you developed a certain type of ethos, you know, like this kind of code of conduct for yourself that kind of seemed to forge when you're in, when you're in prison, you know, tell us a little bit more about like what your ethos is. Cause I think that's a super important thing to have, like something that you fall back on when things are in question, you're confused, you're tired, you're pushed to your limits, you know, to have that code. That's this unbreakable thing that you know, that, you know, that's just something that is not in question anymore. I always, um, follow a lot of the, the samurai code. Mm -hmm. You know, I've always felt that, um, like when I fought, I was a slave. Is where I put my mind. I said, this is, uh, you know, Jermaine Andre, you're a slave to your teachers and trainer, to Ron Smith. You know, you sacrifice everything for them. Nothing else matters. You know, uh, you get a chance to watch a lot of my fights. You'll even see when I win. You know, I didn't, I didn't raise my hand. I didn't, ah, you know, most of the time I go check on my guy, you know, if he was hurt, you know, if I knocked him out or something to make sure mm -hmm. he was okay because it was, it was a good day for me, a bad day for him. You know, mm -hmm. that's a fellow martial artist. He's trained. His family's watching. So I felt more for him than, you know, just wanting to – hold my hand up which didn't do me real good for ratings <laughs> you know yeah, but yeah, yeah, you know yeah. what i'm saying nobody wanted to see that samurai quiet stuff except japan you know which right. eventually that you know you see what happened with pride and all that kind of stuff it just kind of faded out but um when i when i fought i, I just made sure that i kept my mind focused that you know um that i was samurai mm -hmm. you know you, you you're in servitude you know nothing for you matters the only thing that matters is what you're accomplishing for your trainer you know for the muay tigers for the people who you said you're going to do something for so that, that that thought of slavery gave me freedom. You know, then now I was free to tell anything and anybody that caused me a distraction, no, you know, you no, you can't, I can't do that. Well, why mm -hmm. not? It doesn't matter. I don't even need to explain to you, you know, because over here, you know, I had this code that I had to stick to or I, I was nobody. You know, and the, the samurai code actually saved me because I remember um, when I was in county jail, the, um, a, um, what do you call him a correction officer. I don't think they called that in jail, but he was uh, the first one I met that made me start liking, you know, liking uh, like cops. And when I say that, I never disliked them, but I was just always in the middle. But he just complimented him, man, you're so strong. You look, oh wow, you, you know. He'd always sneak me out to lift weights. Hey, you, mm -hmm. man, come here. You want some extra weight lifting? I said, yeah, thanks. You know, so I was, we started becoming friends. And he even said to me one day, man, I heard that you and your wife pulled on. What are you, Bonnie and Clyde? Man, that takes a bar. And I heard you guys won't even talk to the cops. And she won't say anything. Man, you guys are straight gay, man. If I had friends like you, you know, and I'm just kind of like, <laughs> wait a minute, you a cop. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But he's being real with me, you know? Yeah, so I'm just kind of yeah. like, you know, and, and so we started connecting. And then he said to me, he's like, man, you you straight samurai. You know, I was like, what? You say straight samurai, man. You you know samurai. And I was like, all right. He said, man, I'll get you some books. And so I started reading, you know, and learning a little bit. I'm like, oh, this is dope. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm digging this. So I can be a, you know, I said, I can be a badass. And I can be someone who's willing to take that plunge and not afraid to die, not afraid to go down and not have to be an idiot. You know, when I read, you know, about being a samurai, you can't die a dog's death. Because that was one of my problems. I was always, always confused on, okay, when am I supposed to not stand up? You know, when am I supposed to stand up? You know, this guy talking smack and pissing me off. Am I supposed to go and beat his head in? You know what I'm saying? Oh, that's mm -hmm. a punk. You know what I'm saying? So they have to define that. No, that's a dog's death. You can't do There has to be honor in your death. So that's what really pulled me into that code, you know, and I yeah. started studying them more. And one of my favorite stories, um, you know, well, of course, the code you're talking about is Bushido, yeah. which is the, you know, the famous samurai code of honor. And actually the word samurai means to serve, which right. not a lot of people know as well. Uh, but the favorite, one of my favorite samurai stories is, uh, a shogun sends uh, one of his top samurais to go execute this known thief. 
And so the samurai goes out to the th- this thief's house and is going to execute him. And the thief, you know, gets him and spits in his face as, right as the samurai is pulling out his sword. And the samurai puts, it back. puts his sword back <laughs> in yep. and leaves. <clears throat> Comes back again next week. And, and the thief tries it again, spits in his face, and the samurai just keeps on going. The thief's like, hey, wait, what, what happened last time? Last time, you know, I spit in your face, you left. He said, well, last time I was angry. And then he takes the sword and cuts off his head, you know, because the code of the samurai was that he could not commit violence and anger. Right. You know, he had to do it with a calm heart. Yep, it could be personal. It couldn't be personal. It had to be for your master. Exactly. <laughs> not for exactly. yourself. Yep. So even though he was going to do the same thing, he, the way and the manner in which he did it was, you know, the most important thing to him, you know, and that's that's what having that code can bring, you know, and, and a lot of us don't have anybody in particular that we – feel that necessity to you know to want to serve another individual because you know other individuals are fallible as well but you know for me for a lot of people you can put a higher ideal as something that you'll serve right you know so the idea of you know uh to borrow something that that is spoken a lot down in peru from this old chavin tradition they say para el bien de todos for the good of all so then you can use that for the good of all as who you're serving that's your shogun you know like what is going to be for the good of all and then if ever you're in doubt and ever you're worrying is this action for the good of all no it's not so so it doesn't fit with your ethos and it's easy it's easy to uh to cut it off and the golden rule keeps you there yeah you know i keep playing so what i want somebody doing this to somebody i care about you know somebody who's not as strong as me you know i've got people in my family who aren't as strong as i am Mm -hmm. you know and one of my i tell you one of my main things like a lot of um, you know, you look at me, I, I stay in good shape. And one of the main reasons is because I know that I have to stay at a, at a point to lead my students. So like, you know, it'll be days I go up to this martial arts school by myself and I'm like, man, I don't feel like doing this crap. You know, I'll pick up the 40 pounders, you know what I'm saying, instead of the fifties. But the first thing I do, I'll think of one of my students who had the sixties in his hands the other day. And I said, I can't, you know, I can't betray him, man. <laughs> right. I can't betray her. I think about that mom that trained under me who was, you know, 50, 60 pounds, went through a divorce. You know, I trained her and got her in shape and she did tough motor, you know, 14 mile obstacle course. And I say, there's no way in the world I cannot not do this because I don't want to. So now my students become my master, mm-hmm. you know, so now there's this circle that's going. Then they're saying, well, I can't let him down. I'm saying, I can't let them. Down. So this beautiful circle is just going, you know, that helps us all to keep ourselves straight. Yeah. So talk us to a little bit. Talk to us a little bit about um, some of these leadership principles that that you're mentioning, because you've obviously been effective, even early on, just instinctively, you know, leading people. So, so if you had to write, you know, Jermaine Andre's principles of leadership, you know, what what <laughs> Look, would those don't be? do that? I would start another book. <laughs> <laughs> don't do that. Look, we already got like 50 books. I'm trying to sell. My assistant's probably sitting knocking the computer over now. She's like, stop it! I'm trying to get him to stop writing books. <laughs> <laughs> I like that though. <laughs> um, too late. <laughs> the idea is planted. Well, I mean, you know, you have to be careful of who you lead. You know, um, for one, you mm-hmm. know, especially when it comes to, you know, the martial arts. The martial arts is you turn a person into a weapon. You know, so you you have to be patient in training them, and which is something I'm actually seeing a lot now, especially with the MMA world. Um, you know, everybody's just handing out arm bars just to get a paycheck, you know, to, and they're handing out the five-year-olds. And I'm like, dude, that's a little kid that you teach him to break an arm. The rear naked choke is deadly force. I yeah. train police officers, I train military, and they cannot grab a person around the neck. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Even though we do it on TV with the referee there saying, all right, break. You know, but I say, you, you got to be careful showing these kids that, man, because they're going to get a hold of somebody and, you know, and do this. So you, you have to slowly train them and discipline them and things like that, you know, so – Anytime you're taking up a position of leadership, number one, you have to feel a very strong sense of accountability towards whoever you're leading mm-hmm. of what they're going to do with whatever it is you're teaching them, you know. And then, of course, I always myself, I try I try to say, you know, um, don't try to get somebody to do something that you're not willing to do. But in saying that, I have to be careful because there's a lot of things I can't do on computer. You know, yeah. there's a lot of things I can't do, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> right, right, and right. I, I need somebody to do it, and I, I, I can't do it. So, you know, when it, when it really comes to it, that's, and that, that sounds good. Not necessarily that you can't do it, but that you wouldn't do. You know, you but, would do everything if you could. Oh, if I could, right. You know, and right. I, I think that's, I think that's where, where the important distinction is. Yeah. Know? So uh, definitely stay close to your people. You know, keep a personal relationship with each one of them. You know, um, um, and you got to care. 
And that's like uh, my trainers. When I certify my trainers, I say the most important thing is you have to care for them where you don't want them to get hurt and you want to see them develop. And I say if you keep that in your mind, you probably won't ever make a mistake. And we've been, you know, we've been training people for 15 years. You know, I've been, well, and if you want to count the inside, it's been, well, people got hurt in there because we were training differently. <laughs> that was mm-hmm. hardcore. You know, but as far as out here on the streets, training everyday people, I've never had anybody get injured. Yeah. You know, because we're very careful with what we do. And I say if you have to care about that individual, you have to care that they're moving forward and that they're not getting hurt. And you'll see everything. You'll be able to see the main thing you'll do is you'll be able to read their expression. You know, yeah. their expression tells you everything when injury's coming, you know, if they can and can't handle it, you know, all that kind of stuff. So that's that's a, 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 a few of the things, you know, the most important things about leadership that I put out there. You know, that last one seems simple, but it's not. No, it's you know, not. Really caring about someone. It's really easy it's time to consuming. see. And it's also, it's easy to see someone as their function. You know, okay, this is my student whose function is paying me who's, you know, so the reward is for me to keep him as long as possible paying me, you know, right. rather than like, and you don't do that consciously because that sound, you sound like a sociopath when you're doing it consciously. <laughs> but like, it's easy for the brain to think of people and function. Like this person is this function, this person is this function, right. rather than this is a human, an imperfect as we all are, who has these dreams, aspirations, goals, struggles, challenges, and like really connecting with them as a, as a, human or right. it doesn't even have to be a human it could be an animal a horse that you're riding or a, a yeah. dog that you have in the house like connecting with them not as their function like oh you're my means of transportation or you're supposed to be my friend or blah 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 but really connecting with them as an individual autonomous being yeah and or even looking at the the fucking earth you know i, I look i think about all of the people who do these you know horrendous environmental c- catastrophic things to the earth and I think about it and it's like, if they really actually cared and loved for the earth, they wouldn't do it. Right. You know, because only a complete psychopath would hurt someone or something, something that they love. Right. That they <laughs> love. Yeah, care of them. Yeah, exactly. So, but instead they see it as a function. Oh, this place is a place that provides me resources, right. which allows me to do it. So instead of seeing the entity, they see the function. Yeah. And I think that's something that we can always, you know, remind ourselves of. Like, don't look at the function, like your girlfriend as the function of girlfriend or your wife or whoever. Oh, that's that's her function. It's her job to love me, feed me, blah, blah, blah. Not yeah. like this. Look at this, you know, living, breathing, you know, spirit embodied meat sack that, yeah. is, that is floating <laughs> around here. You know, like really connect with what that entity is. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. Well, and that makes it really hard, you know. Um, I don't know if you ever had a chance to read Kodo, but um, they say in that book that you know, for any any martial art instructor to think he's going to become, you know, a millionaire from it is an idiot. And you know, yeah. of course, we we hear all kinds of things that we like. Whatever, man, I'm getting ready to do this. You know what I'm saying? And I, I tell you what, I've lost so many students, especially youth, because parents want me to rush things. You know, and I'm like, no, you know, I'm, I'm trying to slowly develop him. So I get stuck in that position of, you know, sensei and businessman. Mm-hmm. And it's like, OK, but I got people counting on me business wise or else, you know, I'm not I'm not I'm a horrible businessman. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because yeah. I'm sitting there saying, OK, if I tell this mom or this dad what they want to hear and say, sure, no problem. I'll give him that. He can do this and that. They get ready to put five grand on the table. If I say no, they're going to the school down the street that's going to say yes. Mm-hmm. And so many times I've had to do that, you know, and they walk out, then they're bad-mouthing you behind your back and everything else, you know, and I'm sitting there saying, you know, man, you came to me to help develop him to what I believe is a martial artist, and I'm trying to do what it takes, you know, and you're getting results, you know, but I can't give it to him as fast as you want while you're sitting in the lobby, you know, bored, of course, like, oh, my God, what's going on? I'm so tired of coming up here every day. You know, and I understand that, you know, but that's kind of where, where you were saying like that, you know, when you're trying to it, – it's hard to – to care about your clients when it's your business. Yeah. Because the business is you're supposed to be trying to make money, make money, make money, make money, run the business, run the business. But, you know, sometimes that could get in the way because of how demanding, you know, uh, we are, you know, in society as, as people. Sure. Which is, you know, which is great. And you know, I tell people all the time, you know, uh, a lot of, you know, we all play the biggest part in corruption. You know, the reason fast food exists is because we eat it. You know, they're not out there saying, hey, this is all you get. It's because we're saying, hey, man, come on. Hurry up, hurry up. Give it to me, give it to me, give it to me. Mm-hmm. And if he don't keep up, Burger King going to take over. McDonald's going to shut down. You know, yeah, so they're yeah, saying, yeah. look, just keep up and keep giving them what they want. You know, so, yeah, we run, I run into that 
problem a lot. And then you, but the thing is, I end up with good the ones who stick with me. I end up with good, solid students. Yeah, you know. But yeah, no, it, pay, it pays off in the long run. I think another key part to that is you got to really take care of yourself too, because if you're yeah. if you're in pain, if you're hurting, if you're suffering it's really hard to give a shit about anybody else. Yes. You know, like the natural instinct, any animal that's in pain, it can be the friendliest motherfucker on the planet, yep. but if they're in pain and they're hurting and they're sick, whoop don't ass. fuck with them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They, they will lash out. They don't give a shit anymore. Yeah. You know, and that's and that's the same with people, you know, and, and that's, you know, I'm running a, a company now that we're, getting close to 50 employees and we have our own customer service and, and everybody here looks good too yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah and it's it's important that everybody's happy because right. every interaction that they take you know with any customers and and anything like that if they're unhappy in their position and they're not fulfilled and they're not you know really cared for and treated with the utmost respect that's going to flow through to everybody else as well Definitely. i mean it's a cycle that that perpetuates yes and it's super important and and even in those, you know, stressful situations, you know, remembering that just to keep that in mind, you know, take care of yourself and then see people as people. I mean, that's just if, if everybody just did those simple things, you know, because you look at some of these fucking things that people write about each other on the Internet, like YouTube comments, oh, yeah. particularly and forums <laughs> and stuff like that. It's like if you really had to say that to the person and watch them get sad because you said you know, how ugly they were, how fat right. they were, whatever. Could you really do that? Could you really look them in the eye with those mirror neurons firing and say that to that individual? You know, no, but because it's some fucking anonymous game that they think they can do. Well, that's what happens work. to all that cyberbullying. Because right? they don't because they don't see people as people. Right. You know, and they don't and they're suffering themselves too. They have some probably you know, serious self love issues. <laughs> you know, which is well, why, which is also why they're lashing out. But those simple principles would correct a massive, massive rift. Well, that's one of the reasons I flew down here to do this. You mm -hmm. know, and uh, my guy Billy's actually one who connected us. And he's like, oh man, you know, I'm telling these guys, this is this show, you, you gotta, you know, you can do it over the phone. And I was like, you know, well, how long is it gonna be? You know, this is a five minute interview, you know, two minutes, you know, he's like a couple hours. I'm like, a couple hours? <laughs> I said, okay, I like that. You know, yeah. so we can really talk. Instead of, you know, just, you know, all right, God, get out of here now. You know, next thing on, you know. So I said, well, but yeah, if we're going to do this, man, we got to sit down and look at each other. You know, and yeah. that's what people are losing mm -hmm. nowadays. They're lo losing that connection, that, you know, that that communication, mm -hmm. you know. And I got I got a thing that I created I call uh, uh, the cure to everything. And I always tell everybody it's, it's compassion, understanding, respect, and education. And then I say whenever you meet somebody, first just have compassion for them automatically. Mm -hmm. Think to yourself, I have no idea what he's been through. I have no idea what he's been through. I have no idea what he's been through. And you don't know, if I had to go through what you've been through, I might have blew my head off many years ago. So I'm going to give you compassion first. You know, then understanding, try to understand where you're coming from. You know, okay, why you do the things you do, why you did the things you did. You know, and try to get a sense of true communication instead of being immediately judgmental. Yeah. You know, and then respect. Well, that's the opposite. Judgmental Judgment is the opposite of compassion. Exactly. You know, it allows you to create some barrier. And, and I think, you know, you have to be really careful of that because that idea is really insidious. It gets in your head, even if someone else is around you is doing it. I remember I was on a, I was on a medicine journey down in Peru and um, and someone there was saying awesome person, but had some judgments that he was carrying about some other people. And he would mention mm -hmm. them. And I really respected this individual. And so even though I wanted to reject those judgments, they had found their way in my brain. You know, and yeah. so his ideas and his judgments about these people, I was like, it, it would sit with me uncomfortably. I had to like actively work yeah, you to try, push and, that crap try out. and remove it. It's like a virus, yeah, man. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is. So, you know, <laughs> yep. you got to be careful. Like you can really easily poison the well with, right. with somebody, you know. Well, and, we're just, and it's, we're like it, say, we're just a word. Just a word. Yeah. yeah. And, and And better is to just understand that you know we're all in varying degrees of our process right you know, and that's that's okay and anything you know any attribute that you see you can probably find at least the the bud of that in yourself you know any yeah. kind of someone's angry if someone's disrespectful if someone's someone's mean i mean even acts that you find despicable you know you can still have compassion for that person i'm not saying don't stop it i'm not saying if a robber comes into your house 
you know, and trying <laughs> right. to kill you. Yeah, you like, can't be stupid. I understand <laughs> that. that you want to stab me with that knife. No, you <laughs> fucking shoot him. You kill him. Whatever. You got you to stop that shit from happening. But at the same time, do it like the samurai with compassion, knowing like, right. you know, this is just what needs to be done. I'm not going to let you, imp- you know, impinge upon my right to live. Right. You know, but I'm not going to do this with joy and yeah where i, I want to kill vengeance. somebody yeah, yeah, yeah you know yeah, i'm gonna exactly. do what i have to do and feel right. bad about it you know right. because i took a human life you know right and i don't know why you were doing this maybe his kid was starving you know what i'm saying yeah. Yeah. and you find like oh my god that's you know but I, this and this gives a good example i was training a security team uh sunday and uh they were all bouncers big boys and one of them said hey you know i came up so we were talking about imminent assault you know an imminent assault mm-hmm. can be a ball fist a curled lip anything like i was teaching them about it and he said, well, hey, I, went, I came upstairs one time, and this guy was arguing with his girlfriend. And, uh, you know, I walked over to him. I said, you know, hey, what's going on here? And he put his hand on my chest. He said, is that an imminent assault? Do I have the right to punch him in his face? I said, yes, it is imminent assault. He's like, okay, yeah. I said, no, hold up, stop. I said, come back over here. I said, now, why did he put his hand on your chest? Well, I don't know, but he touched me. I said, wait a minute. Maybe he didn't know who you were. Maybe he thought you were somebody coming up to hit him, and he was just trying to stop you. I said, so you want to knock his teeth out for that? Yeah. Do you feel that's right? You know, and I said, how do you know when he was arguing with his girlfriend? His girlfriend didn't do something super wrong. I said, how many of us in this room didn't wanted to knock our girlfriend out before? <laughs> you know, <laughs> all of us probably have. You know, hopefully none of you have, but everybody. So you can't always want to jump on the girl's side and beat the get crap out of the guy and play, you know, superhero. Yeah. That's not what it's about. He might be the nicest guy in the world. And he just put his hand on you to stop you from approaching him. And mm-hmm. I said, if you'd have knocked his teeth out, that's what's going to come out in court. And the jury gonna look at you as big as you are. This guy standing five foot three. Even if it doesn't come out in court, you know, you know what's right? Exactly. You know, like what's right? And, and and some people, you know, I have some buddies who are great street fighters, and you know, it's it's fun and tempting to just kind of go along with the stories. But right. I know that there's some people who are getting their ass kicked that really shouldn't have gotten their ass kicked. Definitely. You know, just something that would have been real easy to just be like, okay, whatever, dude. Right. You know, and just walk away. But just because some butt of some escalation doesn't necessarily mean that that guy deserves an ass whooping. Now, there are some people who deserve an ass whooping. They need that that kind of dose of reality to come in and say, hey, this is this is the laws of the fucking world. And it, it's like it would be helpful for their, you know, for their life to do it. But there's other people who are just, yeah, maybe they're having a fucking bad day. And do they deserve to get fucking stomped out, you know? Probably not. And being able to discern those situations where it's someone who's just going to antagonize people indefinitely until someone says, all right, motherfucker, you know, you're yeah. about to learn something now. Yeah. Like, here, I'm taking you to school, not because I want to, <laughs> but because you need to go to school versus somebody who's just at the wrong place at the wrong time and just gets, you know, gets a shit beat out of them. Well, I always remind them, I say, you know, who wins a street fight? So I always ask, you know, it depends on who's the biggest. I said, no, nobody. Yeah. I said, because... If you whoop somebody's ass, they're going to go get their daddy's gun and come back and blast you later. Mm. Probably when you walk into the store with your daughter, you know, when you don't feel so tough. You know, and that always hits them right there. And a lot of times that's what it takes. A lot of people just don't, they don't have, and that's why I say the education comes yeah. in. When I say that, you know, and I, I say things like that, guys, you got to think that if you end up getting into a fight with this guy, that might come back around five years from now. Right. You know, he's going to remember you. You knock his teeth out. You know, you crack his head open, he's just not going to forget you. And then you're going to become a, a, you know, go to church and get your degree and everything you were trying to do while you were here as a bouncer. And now you made it happen, got your home, got your wife, two kids, and he's still missing those teeth. And he's going to run into you, you know, and guess what? Now what? You know, oh, man, I don't want to fight today. I didn't want to fight that day. <laughs> so right. now what? So when you I put it to him like that, that really helps him to start thinking about it. You know, because a lot of people that just, you know, you, you got to say, is compassion in people or uh, is it taught? You know, can it be learned? You know, and I always, I don't have an answer for that right now. You know, I've always had compassion. You know, I had a situation actually uh, when I was locked up, a guy, Aryan Brotherhood, attacked me from behind. He had a big giant padlock on a weight belt and cracked me in the back of the head, you know, while I wasn't looking. Well, it did absolutely nothing to me. <laughs> and I turned around and looked at him. And he was just like, <gasps> Now you mother, get in here. And I beat the crap out of him, you know. And I've said, I remember I had his, had his head. He was, you know, here and out, knees, elbows, everything, because he didn't know how to fight, mm-hmm. you know. And I had his head, and I was looking at the edge of the desk. It was just like this. And I said, I have the right to kill him because he just attacked me from behind. I'm bleeding. You know, mm-hmm. he's got the weapon in his hand. And I looked at him, and I said, I've got, I've got in front of me a, a, a hurt creature that yeah. can't defend itself. And that's all I saw. There's a hurt creature, and I felt sorry for him, even though I had done it. He'd attacked me, and I and I sat him down, and let him go. 
you know, and I just kind of looked at him and I was like, I said, and I thought again, I can knee him in the face. I can, I can really build my rep up big, just beat the crap, and I can kill him and get away with it and win in court. And I, and I couldn't do it. Yeah. You know, and I, I said, man, can you walk back to your cell? You know, yeah, I can make it, man. I think you broke my rep. I said, all right, well, man, come on. And I helped him back to his cell, you know, so we wouldn't get busted. You know what I'm saying? And we ended up getting busted anyway. But, I don't know if you can teach somebody that or if it's automatically in people or if they just, you know, what was what will somebody do when you got the right? Like you say, this guy comes to your house, he's got a knife in his hand, and you say, hey, mother, you know, and he said, okay, don't shoot, please. And you got every right to blow him away. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? Right. You know, and we're dealing with a lot of that right now. St. Louis, everybody's running around, CCW this, CC, I got my concealed weapon. I, I hope Ferguson does this. I'm going to this. I'm going to that. I'm like, dudes, where's your hairs at? Yeah. You want to see a war break out? Okay, that's going to be cool for you when you're winning. But what's going to happen when the end of the barrel is pointed at your daughter right. or your mom or your sister, somebody who ain't don't want to be involved in the middle of this crap? You know, quit thinking about your ego and think about those types of people. You know, so you have to, like you say, you have to ask yourself, can you teach people compassion? But I do, when I, when I train these bouncers and security and police officers and I talk to them and teach them those kind of things, I do see a flicker in the eye. Mm -hmm. And I and I always see results. You know, those clubs, those venues. I remember when I took over the monastery, I don't know if you ever heard of it. If you ever look it up, it was like the worst uh, club in East St. Louis, Illinois. I mean, just straight gangster. I mean, you had, they played, it was Lil John all day long. You know, who you with? <laughs> who you with? So everybody came in. The, the bouncers were gang members, were crips. You know what I'm saying? And I came in, the owner was a friend of mine. He brought me in to clean up the security. So the first thing I did was fired all the gang members. You know, I said, yeah. dude, you can't be security if you're, you're going to go, oh, man, yo, cuz. I said, hold up a second. I said, wait a minute. A security guy is one step away from a cop. So you a cop or you a gangbanger? Oh, I said, well, we can, no, because everybody gets security shirts. I'm going to put a security shirt on you, and you're going to be a cop in here? Oh, well, no. So, you know, but that's my verbal judo. Right. Instead of them feeling like I fired them, I said, no, you keep your job. But you want a security shirt, and you're getting a badge. Oh, man, that's messed up. I ain't no cop. I said, security's cops. Yeah, it's yeah, your yeah. job to save lives, not to be in here throwing gang signs and gangbanging. That's not what you're going to have. But when I trained all these guys and got them to understand, you know, things like that, and, you know, guys, would you? Don't do something to somebody that you wouldn't let them get away with. You know, if you were if you were doing this and drinking and having fun, and a bouncer came up to you and acted in the way you acting towards him, would you take that or would you go get your gun? I go get my gun. Okay, why do you think he's not going to go get his? Yeah, you know, kick it, Ricky. Yeah, you're right. You know, okay, exactly. You know, so uh, and I seen these lights flicker, and it got to the point where we had no problems in there. It you seems, know? you know, it would seem to me that compassion is innate within us all, but it can be unlearned very easily. Yeah. You know, and then the key to that is just you see it in a, pretty much every conflict that there is. You know, what is one of the most important facets of any conflict is dehumanizing the enemy. You right. Know? And religion has done a great job of that. These people are infidels. Right. You know, these people are deserve some kind of punishment from. Yeah, because they don't believe the way we do. Because they don't right. believe the way that we do. Or even if it's not a if it's a not a religious you know, kind of conflict or ideal. It's, you know, these people are Politics. evil or savages <laughs> or whatever. You look at all the propaganda, like that's such an important part is to remove compassion. Right. You know, so that, that, and place judgment, remove compassion, which allows this fertile ground for combat. Yeah. And that's the same with racism. It's the same with every different other aspect that you can look at. Even a rival gang, oh, these people are that person. This is a blood. This is not a, this is not a dude who just happened to be in that neighborhood that was red rather than this neighborhood that was blue, yeah. you know, and we're all pretty much, we're all the same fucking, we're all struggling the same for thing. the same thing, you know, <laughs> yeah. but, it, but it, that judgment allows you to remove compassion, which is the only way that, you know, we can do it. And, and I think the mere fact that <clears throat> all of these mechanisms to remove compassion are always in place when you do see conflict to me means that we are born with compassion because you have to remove that right. in order for conflict to ensue. Mm. I like that. Judgment removes compassion. Yeah. I like that right there. Well, man, this was awesome. We're going to have to do this again sometime, yep. my brother. That was just the blue peel. Yeah, <laughs> that was, the that was it, man. <laughs> you get the red peel next so, time. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your books, where people can find you, everything like that. Um, well, JermaineAndre.com, you mm -hmm. know, is where I'm at, J-E-R-M-A-I-N-E-A-N-D-R-E.com. Um, is a place to find my books. I've got a really good book out right now called Ice, Intercom and Explosiveness. And I use it's for athletes mm -hmm. and definitely for fighters. And what I actually did was um, I was um, proposed with by um, a company 
regarding something happened, you know, with the NFL, you know, you had the NFL players getting into all the trouble, you know, the, the drunk driving and, you know, uh, the player who smacked his wife and knocked her out. Yeah, and, Ray Rice. Yeah, and they wanted to bring me in about, you know, character, about and start yeah. training these guys. Look, man, you know, this is how you be a warrior and a destroyer on the field, and this is how you maintain and cage that animal on the streets and treat people, you know, the way they're supposed to be treated. So in the process of us working towards that, I wrote this book called Ice. And what the book does, and I gave you a copy of it, mm -hmm. is it, I, I gave everything the way I think, the way I thought, you know, when I competed, when I fought about, you know, about everything, losing and about having a, a moral code, you know, I gave codes that you can follow to help keep you in order, you know, about your entourage and things like that, you know, just all that stuff, plus some of the uh, workouts that I did mm -hmm. that helped to make me, you know, give me, you know, real strong legs and things like that. So that's a really good one. For, um, you know, athletes, for pro athletes, uh, amateur, you know, high school, intramural, anybody like that. Yeah. You know, plus I've got a um, another book that I wrote um, that's really good. It's called The Fighter's Bible. Now, it's funny with this book. I said, I need to write everything that's important regarding a fight. And I wrote the book and I gave it to uh, Crew Ryan Smith, my Muay Thai instructor. Mm -hmm. He read the book. Man, that's a really good book. This and that. Da, 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 da. He sounds just like that too. Man, it's a really good book. You know? mm -hmm. And he said, uh, you know, you didn't write anything about fighting in there. And I said, oh, man, I, said, I guess I need to put that. He said, no, you don't. Wasn't it the most important stuff regarding fighting? I said, yeah, what happens outside the arena? Yeah. You know, dealing with your affairs and your flight and your life and your, your diet and, and showing up to the, you know, and make sure you make weight. And I, I, I covered all of that stuff, <laughs> you know, and never said anything. And it takes you all the way up to walking out to the ring. Yeah. And then that was it. That's all I covered. You know, so that's a really good book to help people to prepare. But that's where I saw all of my flaws in my fight career was because of what was going on outside. Of me. Sure. Not because of what happened in there. It was what happened sure. before I went in. So that's a that's a good one there. And then, of course, Muay Tiger is a story that we were just talking about. Um, you got, a you know, a, the tip of the iceberg. There's some, you know, pretty wild stuff in there. It's a, it's a 17 and up book. Um, you have the unedited version, so the, no editor's been through there and taking stuff out. Oh, get this out of there! That's a, yeah. you know. So it, 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 I haven't released it yet. And what I do is I'm just allowing certain individuals to read it because it's still we're just not ready to yeah. put it out there yet. But that's the spot to find it. And one of my main things now, I like I like you know training people in Muay Thai kickboxing, especially for MMA. That was what I used, you know, in my uh, MMA fight game was you know Muay Thai and sprawling. Of course, I knew Jiu-Jitsu and Russian Sambo, you know. But my main thing was to knock people mm -hmm. out and. My my passion is security, police, uh, bodyguards. You know, because they're, they're the guys who are out there putting themselves in position to protect others. Yep. You know, so they need to be the baddest. You know, and I haven't said this yet, motherfuckers. <laughs> you know, <laughs> in the world. And I tell them that all. And I even tell cops as they do. You know, and look, you know, I've been in the joint and everything, but you know, you're dealing with the real deal. And if you're afraid to get trained by me. Wait till you run into another Jermaine Andre out there who ain't ain't on your side. Yeah. You know, it's gonna be over for you. He's gonna destroy you. And there's a whole bunch of them out there. You know, mm -hmm. and that badge means nothing to him. So awesome, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate you coming oh, all the way down it was here. Fun, man. This was great. Yeah. So um anything uh anything I can do in the future, man, just just holler. Let me know. But we'll certainly keep in touch. I look forward to reading your books and keep doing what you're doing. We need a lot more of you out there in the world. All right. Or give me a call after you read the books. And I got a waiver for you to sign because if you destroy any towns or anything after you read the book, <laughs> that's all you. You can't be like, you made me do it. <laughs> so. I just come back like Shiva the Destroyer, just all fucking fire in my eyes. <laughs> Look, you might go do a fight career after reading that book. Fight. <laughs> train, train me. Oh, you know man. That's awesome, man. Well, thank all you right, a lot, man. my friend. Yep. Thank right. you. I really appreciate sure, you. For sure. Me. All right. All right, my people. I will see you soon. Much love. Peace.